Louise Bezard here, your host of the Talking Trading Podcast. This is how traders excel. Now, I have got a little story for you today about one of my very first brokers. Way back when, before I'd written my book on options, which many of you will know is the secret of writing options, way back when, I had a broker and he said to me, well, you've finished up at your job now. It's probably time you earn some income out of the markets. How about you write options? Now, I thought he was offering me a job. That's how green I was. I hadn't even heard about options. I had no idea about how they worked. But then eventually, I did start writing and buying options, and it became such a wonderful way to replace my income from my previous role as a national manager. Now, I have to tell you that it is okay to know nothing about this topic because that sometimes is where the best insights come from. So I'm going to introduce my guest for today, Guy Cohen. Now, firstly, Guy, how ignorant was I that I didn't even know what he was talking about? I thought he was offering me a job. That's nice. That's a nice offer, isn't it? (laughs) I love that. I love that. Oh, it happens. Now, look, Guy is such an options expert. So he has got a great background for us today. Not only are you, Guy, a trailblazing figure in options trading, you're the author of four best selling books. Now, one of your publishers is my publisher, Wiley, and the book that most appeals to me, of course, especially around this topic, is Options Made Easy. Now, your influence definitely extends beyond the written word. Your options volatility indicator, the OVI, is definitely a household name with options traders. Now, I have to say there's much more to this than just that guy. Fill in the blanks for me. What have I skipped out on? with your background? Well, yes, I guess you could go way back into the 90s where I had an academic background specializing in options on an MBA. And because it was the most difficult module, I thought that, you know, being in my 20s, I could, you know, thump my chest and beat the world. I was going to be up for any challenge. And I, what I did was I didn't understand any of it because it was all being taught academically. But there were two big things that came out of that uh, that then shaped my career, which I had no idea was going to happen. The first thing was that because I didn't understand anything that was going on, I translated the entire option syllabus for that MBA into pictures. And then I understood it. And so that's governed exactly how I do my software and everything else I do. So it's a highly visual approach. And it just so happened that other people who saw it go, wow, that's really good. I can even understand that. And that's how I got the book contracts with, you know, Financial Times and then Wiley. So that, so I translated options into a purely visual subject. And then the software had visuals that move and very intuitive. That was that. And then the second thing that happened at that time was I had two different professors. One was called Gordon, a very academically minded fellow. And the other one was called Kevin, who had been around the city and Wall Street and made millions trading volatility options. And here's what they said in two different lectures. They said, and they were very different types of people. They said, look, if you want to beat the stock market, figure out what the options traders are doing. And that resonated with me. And from that point onwards, I started collecting options data and started analyzing options data. And that's how the OVI, the options volatility indicator was born, because it gave us an ability, which has now been proven quantitatively, to analyze stocks by actually analyzing the options transaction data. So going about things the completely other way around. And people now see the merit of that. But that was, that's the background. And then there was book contracts. I did software deals with NYSE. And, and it kind of just led us to this point where we're at here. I love that. We've got some mutual friends, definitely Casey Stubbs, who's a Casey's a great guy, podcaster, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great guy. Me too. He's been on my show. I've been on his show. And one of the things that Casey and I were talking about in relation to you is, firstly, I did wonder whether you could potentially be the new James Bond. I know that's an unconfirmed rumor, so we. No, I, I think it's. There. I think um, I get, look, it's, I got the hair. Well, you don't see there that you don't see that bit, but Sean Connery was bald as well. So I think it, you know, they can do things about that. 
<laughs> they can. And if you're wondering what we're talking about, you really do need to go to youtube.com slash trading game so that you can see this video because otherwise this is very deeply confusing. You've got an amazing head of hair there. Now, I'd love you to kick off with <laughs> something that I consider to be one of your central tenants. And this is the three master keys. Now, I love this because it provides such a great framework. Could you tell yes. us more about that? Yes, it, it's really interesting that you say that as well, because, you know, we have been doing similar things for quite some time. But as with everything, as technology and research enables you to evolve. But one of the big things that has also evolved with that evolution of technique has been the way to to frame it and to make it easy to understand. So the first master key is market timing. Now, this is you know, the holy grail of trading. It's very elusive, but we have ways and means of, of market timing, which if people go back and look at the history of my blogs, is a little uncanny. But we use various metrics, including options metrics, to determine what we think is most likely to be market timing up down sideways or even don't know don't know is a fine is okay because you don't always know you don't always have that clarity so it's okay to not know so that's the first master key is market timing why is it important so that you can not be fighting against the tide so that's also really important also you know with options particularly you can trade the indices you can trade the etfs they have very low implied volatility it means you have a very high leverage multiple when you get it right. And when the stars align, they're highly predictable. But you don't want to be in, you don't need to be in there all the time. You know, a few times a year is plenty. And with the leverage you can get, which is starts off even deep in the money at being six odd times. And by the time you're racing away, you're getting 10x. That's plenty. You don't need to be greedy. You don't need to be you know, FOMOing on this one. You can be quality, not quantity. So that's market timing. Then the second master key is stock selection. And our entire philosophy of selecting stocks is to follow where we believe big money is either parked or about to go in. So it's a really about supply and demand at the end of the day, but it's big money that creates the big shifts typically. So we have what we call the, the six big money footprints of which the OVI is central and very important as well. So the idea is we follow where big money is going to force a price, either up or down. Effectively, you're looking at markers of potential accumulation on the upside or distribution on the downside. And so that's you, what's going to... This is more than just open interest, isn't it? Oh, this is well, this is way more. The six well, we'll go through the big money footprints. It's way more than that. I mean, the OVI itself uses option volume, open interest, and implied volatility to bake this cake. Now, here we go. Well, I told you there's going to be an interruption, so we may as well. Well, they, <laughs> you may as well show your face. Do you want to come in? Oh, hang on. We've got we've got a little guest, by the way. I'm very open. Do you want to see that. the guest? Yes, I do. Um, Okay, Zippy, come on, come on. Oh, he's, he's gone underneath. He's, I'm, I'm going to stand up. Camera shy. Up huh? <laughs> camera shy. Well, not normally, no, but he's been, anyway, it's the school run time. So there's, there's, anyway, we were, where were we? Yes. Yeah, so, so the OVI consists of, you know, option volume, open interest, and implied volatility to bake this cake. And what's interesting is that, you know, we pioneered this many years ago. Now, with the release of so much data, there's this whole rush for unusual options activity. And sadly, like most things in trading that you get to hear about on the retail side, it doesn't work. It's not backed by proper evidence. And the reason is because unusual options activity is usually punctuated by big spikes in volume or open interest, and they're typically intraday noise. So there's nothing in it. So what we're looking for is something very different. It requires a lot more data. What we're looking for, at least on the OVI side, and that's only one of the big money footprints, is we're looking for what is more likely to be position building, more likely to be accumulation or distribution on a bullish and bearish. And when you align that with the other big money footprints, you get to see this picture evolving where you can see not a chart, but buyers versus sellers. We're anthropomorphizing the trading game. So you can explain it to the layperson and go, look, here's buyers and this is what they're doing. Here's sellers. And it looks like buyers are taking over at this point. And this is now a safer point of entry. And that becomes a, a whole different game. And when it's like the scales coming off people's eyes, they go, wow, I can ditch now 
these thousand different lines and squiggles and indicators off the chart, I can now see what is going with much more clarity and enter it at a, at a much more opportune point. So that's the stock selection master key. And then mm. the last piece, the third master key is the risk management or your trade plan. You have to have obviously your setup that's governed by the big money footprints. Then you have to have a way of establishing control of your trade. That means entry, stop, and then profit targets. And your profit targets should be conservative because you want to get to first base quickly. Once you got to first base, then you can adjust your stops, but then you are in an unassailable position. Now, it might be that the stock runs and you get to catch part of that windfall, or it might not. But the point is get to first profit target quickly. Get there safely. Make it conservative. Don't go for these crazy things that people teach, like I've got to have a four to one, you know, win rate, win loss. Ten exit. You know. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> it's absurd because because obviously the the probability of that happening is the exact inverse of that. So you want a high probability. Now, and why do you want a high probability of success? Is because it keeps you on track. It will keep you staying on course for the plan. As soon as you start to waver then all of a sudden you don't have a plan and you're guessing and gambling. So the idea is to have a framework and a structure where you do hit your, you know, in cricketing terms, your singles, get the singles in and the boundaries will take care of themselves. The home run, you know, get your singles in baseball, the home runs will take care of themselves. And that's the, that's the idea of this whole framework. It's a probabilistic framework and one governed by supply and demand. Okay. And and unique things that that hopefully I'll get to show you as well. Some really unique things that just aren't anywhere else. Just before you show me, though, I just want to slow this down. So let's just pop this into context because yes. we mainly have Australian traders here and this is something that Australian traders need to know because... Yes. The options market in Australia dried up quite a long time ago. So unfortunately for the Australians trying to deal with local options, this makes it very, very difficult. Now, what you're talking about is a weight of evidence concept so that you're working on high probability trades and you're also talking about the choice of universe. So how do we choose the universe that we're going to play in, whether it's US or whether it's Australian or whether it's UK, you still need a way to be able to reveal what is the market that you're going to play in and when are you going to play in it? So even if yeah. you're new to trading, don't just switch off because we've thrown a whole heap of jargon your way. Get Sorry. yourself in the arena. No, no, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. But I do want to encourage everybody to stay listening, stay in the arena, because the more you're exposed to this type of discussion, the better. Now, I just want to backtrack to a couple of things that you've said. Now, generally, as somebody with generally a medium-term view as an equity trader, I tend not to implement a profit target for those types of trades. But I'm hearing profit target from you. Now, could you explain why you're using a profit target? And I think I've got a few ideas as to why that would be, time decay being one. But I would love to hear your thoughts about why you'd use a profit target and when. Well, even if you're just trading the straight equities, it, the reason you have a profit target is to ensure that a, and here's something that everyone's hands should go up multiple times, including yours. So I'm going to be watching very carefully. So if I were to say to you, anyone watching, who here watching, including Louise, has ever let a decent profit turn into a loss? Heck Where's yes. your hand, Louise? And the other one. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's why. Because we don't want decent profits turning into loss. Because it feels awful when that happens. You just feel like you, know, you think, oh, I blew it. And, and what happens is that people imagine the profits they're going to make rather than, rather than focusing on the structure of the trade. They go, you know, if you look at crypto, they go, well, I won't get out until I've 10x'd. Well, only the people who got in very early got that lucky with those things. It was it was a crapshoot in that sense. So you're better off not counting your profits. What you are better off doing is setting a profit target, 
and you get and then you can raise yourself or at least protect yourself at that point so that you are in control of the trade because it's very easy to lose control because you are dreaming of this private island that you're going to make because of this amazing trade you've made and so that's you're talking the- about more of a partial exit at that point potentially or just raising of a stop i mean it yes. can there are three different techniques we have for protecting profits but what we found is this is when i introduced this to my to my you know my members because i was doing it myself because of the pain of allowing profits to turn into losses it it literally transformed their results they now had control over the entry bit but now they had a mechanism a simple mechanism by which they would not now allow profits to turn into losses and and that changes the game because if you think about it, it happens a lot mm, mm, it definitely so if we eliminate does. that that's yeah mm. so that's the that was the reason for it that, which i hope answers your question as well Yeah, this is great. And this is where as well, it becomes quite an individual pursuit. What sort of risk can can you handle? What are you prepared to accept? And what fits in with your trading plan? So I think everything that you're saying is definitely resonating. Now, you were mentioning that you might have a few examples for us. I'd be very open to seeing those. Yeah, I can I can take you through the whole structure because I think you know we we talked about this and and I funny enough I talked with Casey about this just the other day. He mentioned you know our great friend, and you know he was just saying just I love the structure because he's he's kind of shoot from the hip kind of guy as well. But this enforces a structure and it's and obviously you want to make it fun and entertaining as well. But it's much more fun when you're winning consistently. That, that, that makes trading a heck of a lot more fun than anything else. So uh, if I provide the structure and you asked whether this would be relevant for Australian traders, absolutely. Whether they're trading the Australian market or they're trading the US market, which is you know ubiquitous anyway. There's only one of the footprints, as we call it, that wouldn't be applicable for non-US markets. But Every Australian I know trades the US markets anyway. So, you know, I think it's good. So I can share my screen if that's good with you. That would be fantastic. We'd love to see. And I'll just whiz you through it. And and like, because it's in the visual, you can see, you know, you can, you can pause at any time. So the first thing to talk about is obviously the, the simple steps, the three master keys. We have market timing, so we're not fighting the tide. Obviously, the ETFs for the DIA, QQQ, IWM, and SPY provide great trading opportunities as well at times. Then you have stock selection. This is our big money footprints. This is where we're following the big money. I'll walk you through each of those big money footprints in just a moment. And then we have the trade plan. That's entry. It's all about control. This is the edge plan, EDGE, defending your profits early. That doesn't mean to say you have to take them all. You're just defending, you're protecting them. And there is another mechanism within this plan, the G bit, which is grow, which is where you can follow the trend uh, you can't do it without hindsight. With hindsight, so you have to do it after the trend is being established, and then the whole thing has to be enshrined in the evidence of a logical, proven, uh, testable, tested system. So let's just talk about this first. So our our overriding um, principles from the if we're trading U.S. markets is we're looking for evidence of leverage position building, not just unusual option, options activity. And that can lead to profitable price movements. So we're looking at options transaction data of calls and puts. We're looking at share price action chart patterns, which we'll go into. We're looking at volume as well. We're in line with that one. And then the that's on the share side as well. And then you have the evidence of options activity, which could, and we're always talking about coulds here. We're not talking about absolutes. You can't, we're not in the absolute business. Options activity could be indicative of just random, non-useful information. That's a lot of it. It could be bad information. In other words, hedging. Hedging information is not nearly as important as position building information. If you're getting position building information, then there's a weight of conviction behind these this activity, which invariably leads to a higher probability of a weight of move that comes afterwards. So I want to just go through one thing, if I may, and you can cut this out if you want, but if I, people need to understand why prices move. So I, I use this little metaphor, if you if you can allow it. 
So imagine you've got a dream home here, which is at this rather discounted price of $950,000. It would probably cost about 10 times that. But imagine there are three scenarios, and each of these scenarios is actually going to give you an insight into trading, into, into successful trading as well. So the first scenario is that everyone is bidding at the asking price, $950,000. So you, you know, that's Louise, is bidding $950,000. Bob's offering $950,000. Sue and Jim offering $950,000. The question is, what's happened to the price? The answer is nothing. There's big money being thrown at this, lots of offers, but they're all at the asking price. So the asking price remains the same. Scenario two is about information. Now, this information is that Google have just announced they're going to be opening a headquarters five miles down the road. There's going to be 10,000 people working there, all well healed and well paid, and they want facilities in the area. The area is going to improve with new roads, schools, movie theaters, restaurants, leisure activities. The whole area is going to improve. And Bob says, I like this. This area is going to improve. I'm going to up my bid to 960. Sue says, no, I think it's going to be 970. You know, Louise says, no, it's 990. And now what you've got, of course, is a bidding war. Jim offers 1 million. You now offer 1.1 million. This is what moves prices, not just big money, but it's that aggressive big money. It's climbing over other people to push the price up. And of course, it can work on the, in the other way around as well when, when you get a selling frenzy. Now, that's new public information. The third scenario is scarce information. So imagine that Bob, in his previous bid of 960,000, is rather good at his due diligence, has walked around the area, and he's found that behind this lovely home is a big parcel of land owned by an old couple who are privately, not publicly, privately willing to sell. And Bob goes, wow, that's an opportunity because I could buy this house, I could buy this piece of land and put more houses on it or expand. I now know things that other people don't know. It's valuable. I can afford to bid more because I know there's hidden value here. And so he can outbid everyone with his 1.2 million. So scarce information is what can make a huge difference. Public information is important, but scarce information can be even more important. And that's why the diamond dealer typically makes 100 to 200% markup on the diamonds because they've been to diamond school. They get to know about the cut the clarity, the color, the carrot, the source. We are just punters. We're just sort of, we know what we know. They know more. Coca-Cola, scarce information, multi-billion dollar empire with their secret formula, scarce information hidden in that vault in Atlanta. Same thing as KFC with greasy chicken recipes worth billions. Scarce information being this recipe, inverted commas, <laughs> hidden <laughs> recipe. So scarce information can lead to a repeatable mechanism and repeatable profits. And so with that, let's now go into the big money footprints. So the first big money footprint, you okay with the pace here? I'm loving it. Yeah. Okay. So the first big money footprint is a, an acceleration, recent acceleration in volume. So you know that the volume is the number of shares traded. When it's a green volume bar, it's corresponding with the price going up. It, when it's a red volume bar, it's corresponding with the price going down. So if the price is going up and we get these escalating green volume bars, put crudely, then there could be and it's always a could, there could be accumulation going on. So people are buying and they're buying more and more and they're forcing the price up. Similarly, on the way down, they're, they're getting rid of it, they're offloading. So recent volume acceleration is a potential footprint. Then you have recent price acceleration to go along with that. That's big money footprint number two. Now, there's a really important reason why a recent price acceleration is important. And that is because of this eyeballs. Once a price starts to jump, particularly if it was precipitated by an earnings report, let's just imagine that was an earnings report or a news event, and that's precipitated this big jump. What happens is that alarms and alerts are triggered all over trading desks from professionals and hedge funds to the amateurs as well. More eyeballs means more potential for extra demand on the way up or supply on the way down. Now, if it's followed by a lovely pause, like a few sideways bars, giving everyone the ability to catch breath, 
And then with increasing volume, pushing the price up, that's the ideal situation. That's how you get a consolidation in price or a flag, which is a very popular chart pattern. But again, everything has to be in context. So now we're building up a little picture and here. And what we're uh, looking at here, the equivalent would be a breakout. So it's a very similar right. type of look on an equity chart where things have been going sideways. We have a long green candle closing at or near its high, breaking past a previous level of resistance. That's right. That is exactly right. So it could be short-term resistance. Now, the next part is super important as well. So that's big money footprint number two. Big money footprint number three is key levels. And there's a couple of important things about this. So a key level could include something like a 200-day moving average or a 50-day moving average. It's not magic. It's just because it was made famous by Paul Tudor Jones, the famous hedge fund manager. And everyone now has the 200-day moving average on their charts and a lot of alerts. Same with the 50, to a lesser extent, some other levels as well. But again, what's it all about? It's eyeballs. So once a stock goes through this level, or one of these key levels, then lots of people are looking. Now, imagine if you've got other big money footprints in the in the region as well. You've had the big move or you've got the big volume and the other ones I'm about to show you. It means there's lots of people looking, a lot of people analyzing. And if the if the stars align, then there's possibility for a further breakout. And there's another piece to this. This is really, really important about key levels. When you're at a key level, like a 200 or 50 day moving average, you are not overbought on the way up. If you've gone through it, this is definitely not overbought. I don't really want to buy something up here. Okay, because you know that it, any piece of wobbliness could lead to a very big price bar down and then a, a mean reverting situation. That's a so you're hard not to tell, get... though, until you're past that point, isn't it? Because well past, prices can go is... higher than you could ever imagine. It is. But when prices do go parabolic, they also do retrace as well. So we want to, if you're if you're getting this action near these key levels, then the possibility of a of a damaging retracement are much lower. So you want the first or second consolidation after that key level, because you know you're not overbought at that point in time. So in terms of a context for the traders that are listening who've done my mentor program, that would be acting on the first signal. So that's definitely complementary to what we're teaching. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, do you know what? It's funny. I, I've done this and um, before, and I've you know people exactly well, not as charming as you, but the but the point they go. Do you know what? That's what we're doing. We're just describing it in a certain different way. So I'm I'm hoping because I, I suspect we're doing very similar things, Louise. We're just describing it in a certain different way. It's this is just a way of packaging it up. So now we're going to go on to the big money footprint, and and also the other part of this is obviously to describe in terms of buyers versus sellers, what is actually going on rather than saying, oh, here's an indicator, you know, which mm. you know, doesn't mean very much. So I want to now get into the fourth big money footprint about, which is called my OVI indicator, options volatility indicator. But I want to explain why we use it now as well. Why do we use options data to analyze stocks? Well, when it comes to the big boys and girls, the elite investors are using options for two reasons, either to hedge, which is to protect against you know, future price action an event, volatility, time, etc., or to build positions. Now, identifying building of positions in the options world is really, really difficult. It is supremely difficult. And if you can get near it, then you, by definition, have that magical thing called scarce information that we talked about earlier. Lots of people are doing unusual options activity, but it's not exactly scarce information. It's public information. So scarce information is much more valuable. Now, this is the way it works. When you have a bullish escalation in options position building, as, as defined by something I'll show you later, then what could end up happening is that the market maker is selling call options to a very hungry market of call buyers. And if the stock price starts to go up, then the person who bought the options is in good shape because their option, their call options are going up and they have the right, not the obligation, you know, and they have unlimited potential profit. But the person who sold them that options has exactly the opposite risk profile. They have an obligation 
they have a potentially unlimited risk. And so they have to do one of two things to protect themselves. They can either buy call options to mitigate the risk of the ones they've sold because things are getting a little hairy out there, or they have to buy the stock. And if they have to buy the stock, then that is like a hidden short squeeze on the stock because and you can't see it this is the beauty you can't the, to the naked eye you cannot see this going on you have to have special stuff and so if that market maker is now buying stock to hedge their position on their sole calls you've got extra demand which was not hit which was not noticeable now it works exactly the same way but in the other direction i'm not going to go into this because this can get real tongue-tied but you know when you've got excessive bearish options positions like lots of put options potentially being bought, then the market maker has the opposite problem. And so I won't go through that because that, that we want to take a little bit of time, but it can work in both ways. So what happens in the options world can have a direct impact on what then happens to the underlying stock prices as well. Now, what the OVI does is it collects all this data from option chains, all of it. We're talking billions of rows of data. And of course, when I started doing this, on that MBA and beyond, it was quite laborious. You can't scale looking through option chains every day. I mean, as boring as I am, I, even I can't do that. And what the OVI does in one lovely algorithm, it takes the option volume, it takes the implied volatility, and it takes the uh, open interest, and it simplifies it into a very simple line that goes up and down from minus one to plus one, giving a broadly bullish or bearish scenario. And it has been tested in terms of empirical testing, quantitative testing. We use it in automated portfolios as well to great effect. But the OVI does many good things. And, and it's very simple to read. It's very simple to understand. And we can also do algorithms and, and scans and filtering with it as well. So, so it reflects how do we that. access the OVI? Well, the OVI you access through Wise Traders, my website, .com. But you have a special link, I know, Louise, So because you have a special sort of like, like bonus kind of gift that you're doing. But it's only accessible here because this has taken you know, an awful long time to develop and an awful lot of investment to develop. But I wanted to outline that it is a big money footprint in of itself, and we use it for US stocks. Yes. So that's big money for number two. That's the scarce information. And it's scarce for a couple of reasons. There's two reasons why it's scarce. One, not many people have it. It was literally measured in the hundreds. And you know that there are tens of millions of people trading the US markets. And the second one is it has a patent attached to it as well. So I have a, it's actually not patent pending, it's actually patented. And therefore, no one can do what we're doing in that one. And it's, well, it's just really good. Once you got it, you just don't want to leave it. Now I want to get on to big money footprint number five. And this is also a very special thing that we do as well. And it's really, really cool. When what you see on your chart right now, Louise, you are going to tell me that's just a reverse head and shoulders, isn't it? it that's like what you're going to say. That's what you're going <laughs> to say. But it isn't. This is the thing. This is actually shrinking retracements. And what it is, it's one side buyers taking over from sellers. So let me show you what I mean by this. And I'm going to show you a chart in a minute as well. Move number one is clearly bigger than the second move down, is it not? Yeah. And move number two is clearly bigger than the third one, which might even just be a little consolidation as well. Now, in the right context, with other big money footprints around like we've just seen, this could well be a sign that buyers or, or buyers are taking over and sellers are running out of scene because each downward move is shrinking. I'm thinking of a Seinfeld episode there. We don't want to go there. You probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I do, you? I do. You do, you do. <laughs> the Hamptons. Okay. So anyway, for the I know it's very popular in Australia as well. Now, this is the classic head and shoulders pet setup here, which is what we everyone knows as a bearish signal, but don't think of it as a head and shoulders. Don't think of it as a chart pattern. Think about the interaction between buyers and sellers. Who is winning the arm wrestle? In move number one, it's a big move up. It retraces. Then there's another move up, but it's not as big. You get another retracement and then the third one. Now, this second high does not have to even be a high. It could even be, you could even have this and then this and then that. And that could also be it. So don't get hung up on the pattern. What you need to get hung up on is the interaction, what it's actually saying. And so what happens is, I'll show you in a minute, 
how this actually works in a chart. But think about everything you're looking at as a logic between buyers and sellers impacting supply and demand. And there is one final big money footprint, which is our friend, the consolidation. Now, don't want to disappoint people because I'm a big flag fan. But like pretty much all of technical analysis, individually, each of these patterns or the popular patterns in, in technical analysis don't actually have a very good record. And most of them you can't even measure anyway, which also isn't very good. But in the context of big money footprints, then they can be useful. Now, the reason I use consolidations nine times out of 10 is because I it gives me a point of entry and a, pen, and, a, and a point of a stop loss as well, above and below that sideways move. That's why I like them. But once in a while, in the right context, they can also be a big money footprint. And the context is when there are other big money footprints around, and also when the consolidation in price is accompanied by a reduction or consolidation in volume. Because this is what it means from a buyer and seller point of view. Price goes up with big volume. Nice. Lots of big volume. Let me draw this again. Price goes up and big volume. Then the price drifts or consolidates or goes sideways. But there's no conviction in that. Not many sellers around town until then something, a catalyst happens and then price starts to rise again with increasing volume. So again, think of buyers and sellers. And in this context, there could be that the consolidation in price is accompanied by a lack of selling appetite, which means once the buyers come back for more, then the price has no resistance and it has to go up. And it's the same as the downward one as well. So it works exactly the same in reverse as well. So that's when price and volume consolidation can uh, be a big money footprint. And that's together. where looking at the meaning behind the patterns is so important. Many traders skip that introspective step of that's the, right. what is going on here? What are the people thinking that are buying and selling? And that's a beautiful description. What you've described there is just lovely because it's so apparent on a chart. Now let's just put it all together. So this is a, a poster child, and I only give examples that we're on to. This is Sarepta a little while back, maybe last year or maybe the year before, but it's just a beautiful one. I want to show you them all coming together nicely. Now, you're not going to get all six together all the time. You don't have to have all six to make a great trade. There's just some times where an algorithm might just miss it, you know, because algorithms have their beginning and end points, and you might miss it by a fraction, and therefore, oh, it didn't work, but it does. Now, let me show you. Even now, as you look at this chart, you can probably see them all. But let's go through each big money footprint. First of all, the increasing or the, the, the accelerating volume. Now, look where that first spike is happening. It's happening even around here. So really before this thing really starts lifting off. But that's one big money footprint. Buyers are coming into town and they're forcing the price up. Big money footprint number two. That's a pretty big move from 63 all the way up to you know 78 in that case. So that's a pretty decent move. And as you can see, it's traversed one and then later on two key levels. So that's interesting. That's the 50-day moving average there. There's no magic in there. It's just that lots of eyeballs are now looking at this thing. That's, that's really the, this is now, you can see what's happening. Then what happens is a change in the option sentiment as well, as defined by the OVI as well. The OVI has gone from a kind of neutrally nothingy red situation on here to now overtly blue. These are options traders getting interested, the pricing of options changing, and other activity is changing as well. So we're thinking, hang on a second, that's four big money footprints. This is looking pretty good. But I know you can already see the other ones. So let's look at the fifth one. There is shrinking retracement, so they're not. Now, this one didn't form a head and shoulders. The second low wasn't like the first. So don't get hung up on these silly little names, okay? They're just little names. Get hooked up on the activity. This is move number one. This is move number two. It's clearly less, and it bounces from that. And you even get a third, which is pretty much a consolidation by now. So now you can see, come on, guys. Buyers look like they're taking over. This arm wrestle is being won by buyers. And then you have also the price and volume consolidation in there as well, just happening above those key levels. This is 
this is what we're looking for and this is what we like best all and this right so it just all to just to summarize where we're at so far what you've got here is several signals all pointing in the same direction you've got a set trading plan that you're going to execute based on weight of evidence and everything has to be just right because I think so so many times people ignore that they just go oh well you know it's got two out of the ten I'll go because I'm a genius so what you're talking about is trying to develop your edge through purity of thought and specificity of trading plan yeah and eliminating confirmation bias and being as objective and logical as it has. So everything has to have a meaning. Not one of these things on their own is enough. You have to have combinations of them. You have to build that, that as you say, that weight of evidence. And it's very elegant when you look at it this way. And that's what we're looking for. And again, it's quality. And there's another thing I could add to this as well. If you do this with stocks that have low implied volatilities, it means their options are fundamentally quite cheap, not because they're at the moment, we're going deep in the money, lots of intrinsic value. It means then you're going to get good bang for your buck on your options, good leverage multiple. And then later on down the track, you can then start to collect income off your option trade as well. If you can get, you can get kind of sexy with your option strategies, if you've done it in the right way from the right, from the get go. So just to reconfirm for those that aren't 100% familiar with options, when implied volatility is lower than historic volatility, then it's likely to come up with a golden cross sort of situation. So options are considered cheap. So buying an option is a terrific idea because the odds are if you can get the direction right and the volatility right, as well as the time decay, you're in a situation where you do have a high probability that that trade will go up in value. If the opposite occurs, if implied volatility is higher than historic volatility, then you've got options that are quite expensive, in which case it would be better to be an option writer rather than an option buyer. So this does have a large number of legs for this stool to actually be supported. But you can see what we're talking about where it is such a specific trade, where it is something that looking at more than one variable variable is really going to count. Contrast that with the beginner trader that just says, I'm putting it all on black. Big difference. Can I, can I add to that, Louise? Because volatility is a very important topic. Now, there are some many stocks, the historical volatility applies to the actual underlying price action of a stock. And implied apply, is effectively what is is this almost like a future pacing of what the options anticipate will happen with the stock. And of course, what happens here is a great example of Bros, Dutch Brothers, which also exhibited lots of big money footprints recently. This is earnings here. What happens to implied volatility after earnings? Shoots down. Because in the lead up to an uncertain event, volatility creeps up because the market makers need to increase their premiums because if something happens unexpectedly or a surprise to them, they need to have more premium in their pocket. And then once the, the air is out of the balloon, then the premiums can go down, they can lower their premium rates. But what's happened here is that while implied volatility goes down after earnings, the volatility of the stock has shot up, albeit with the stock price rising. By the way, see some nice big money footprints there. So imply, the way that we use implied volatility and again, a little controversial, is that we use it in our it, we use it against itself. We tend to think that you know historical volatility is useful for the stock, but it is kind of theoretical when it comes to the options. So the the more pertinent marker of whether the options are cheap or expensive is measuring implied volatility against itself. And that's why we put it in our charts as well under here. So we can see that after earnings, look at this, you got this big move up. Look, I mean, look at all the big money footprints here. And you've got two lovely consolidations with lovely OVI. You've had some buying volume in here, and then you get that response as well. But you've not just got that response. You've also got it with cheap cheap options at this point as well so you you know it's good to think about 
what something's doing relative to itself as well. If I can just add that into the mix. Now I know, you know, you're getting quite deep into this kind of stuff, but let's just, you know, have fun here again, big money footprints. Look at the shrinking retracements over different time frames. It's very difficult to do that. And then you've got some OVI coming in here. You know, you've got the key levels being crossed, a big move. I mean, you've got five big money footprints right there on Dutch Brothers. And that's why we've had it in our watch list for quite some time. We could see this setup evolving over time, which is, you know, really, really cool. So, we you know, we had it literally, we had it right there and again here. So this is just a recent example of big money footprints. And by the way, nice pattern recognition here, showing the flag, showing the consolidation and showing these big money footprints show up as well, which is kind of cool, I hope. Guy, th this is just fantastic. I'm just going to um, stop that screen share just for the moment. I do think what you've got here is feeding into what a lot of people consider to be a professional trader's view. You've got something very specific that you're following. You've got specific things that you've got in your trading plan that you are ticking off like a pro. So I am loving that. If you could just pop all of this into a nutshell for my traders, what would your advice be to them? Be methodical, be logical. You know, think of the interaction of buyers versus sellers. Squiggles and lines and pretty patterns don't really mean anything. See if you can contextualize them into the activity of buyers versus sellers and build that evidence of, hang on a second, I think here that buyers are taking over. I can see the markers because that's what's going to make the difference for you. And it also makes it a much more interesting game as well than seeing squiggles and lines and angles and all this. And then obviously put it into a trading plan framework as well, where you know where you enter, maybe at the breakout of a consolidation. You know where your stop is, maybe on the other side of that consolidation. And then, you know, another time we could get into how you set a modest, conservative profit target, not just to take all your chips off the table necessarily, but at least to get yourself to first base. Once you're at first base, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be able to lose from that point. And so, and once your win rate is up, you stick with the plan. You have that confidence. It becomes more pleasurable. And, you know, if you're finding that trading is nerve wracking and jangling, it's because you probably don't have the right plan. Guy Cohen from wisetraders.com. Thank you so much for your time. I could just talk to you all day. Not only the accent, you're incredibly knowledgeable about this intricate area and you do demystify it for so many people. Any parting words, Guy? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. I mean, I'm always uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to taking my kids to Australia. We're going to have to meet you while we're there as well. Go to the zoo and all those lovely, see all those lovely animals. Koalas and kangaroos feature very heavily in our home. So uh, I can't wait till they're just a little old enough to, to get them on that flight. It's only 24 hours. But I really enjoyed it. I love your interview. I love the fact that you also looked I think we're doing very similar things. It's obvious to me. And hopefully from the perspective of people watching and listening, just hearing the same thing, but in for a slightly different language, even a different accent might just make a difference. And that's all we're really trying to do here. Make a difference and make it easy for people as well. Absolutely. And that's really what we are about, looking to help people who have got that drive, that ambition, that thing in their heart that they want to achieve. And I think you can see that as well, Guy, that both of us have got our heart in the right place with this. Loving it. If you're a beginner trader and some of this has blown you out of the water, please give yourself time. Stay in the arena. Keep listening to Talking Trading because we will definitely be able to demystify the areas that seem confusing right now. So remember to refer to the show notes so that you you can see all about Guy Cohen and you can refer to his website as well. Terrific having you on the show, Guy. And until next week, I'm Louise Bedford and this is Talking Trading.